parties seem to be largely unprepared for energy transition and the choices, the real choices that are involved. Um, how do we actually engage more people and communities in the energy transition? John, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. I think some parts of uh, society are, are prepared for this uh, transition. Uh, and certainly there have been a, a lot of uh, debates, discussions and statements by governments uh, which say we have to transition and we need to transition. The problem with transitions is that they do take a long time, especially if we're dealing with a system of energy, and it is a whole system of energy, which covers the entire infrastructure of the world. And it is the world's biggest business, if you will. Energy mm -hmm. is for everything. So transitions inevitably take time. And while everybody wishes to have clean energy everywhere, I certainly do, uh, the ability to switch off coal, oil, and gas, uh, we just don't have that ability globally. We might have it in some places, but globally we don't. And we have to think about the time scales, therefore, of this transition. And importantly, for the remaining hydrocarbons, notably natural gas, how we use it and avoid carbon dioxide going to the atmosphere. Decarbonizing hydrocarbons is part of the energy transition and a very important part of it. There's a lot of finger pointing going on at the moment. There's always finger pointing going on when things aren't going right and people are at, at risk. Is, is it justified? Oh, everybody points a finger at everybody just in case they get the finger pointed to them, at them. So, no, that's a very natural uh, form of behaviour in the world. Uh, no one's to blame and everyone's to blame. I mean, the consumer wants more, uh, so you could argue they're to blame, but they're not really. I mean, they're, they're the people who direct what the world happens. The supply isn't forthcoming, so maybe people haven't invested enough. Who knows? Uh, and we haven't decarbonized fast enough. I wish we'd started decarbonizing 25 years ago. I've been on this bandwagon since uh, the mid 90s and uh, you know, not a lot happened. Uh, and then suddenly it's taken off, which is good. But the timescales again of getting things done, they are quite long here. As you know, I have a bee in my bonnet. It's called humanizing energy. What does humanizing energy mean to you? The point of energy is not energy itself. It's the quality of life and the future well-being of the human beings. Uh, and it's simply an input. It's an important input, but there are plenty of other things too. It's about how we behave with it, what we think, how we interact with each other, how we think that this is a societal issue, which is about resource conservation and efficiency, which is something that we all should think about because it's not quite zero sum, but it's getting there. So we need to think about this uh, as a way we interact. Energy is the way we interact. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to be careful to remember uh, that it has to come from somewhere. It doesn't just, electricity just doesn't come from behind the wall. It comes from something far more complex and far more difficult to use and, and to make useful. But we're just doing it because this is what, this is how human beings live. So it's very human. And, and I hope people understand that. It's not about big companies making big money. It's actually about serving customers everywhere and many customers who don't have access to enough energy so we and we have the tools and techniques to help them along mm -hmm. distributed energy systems rather than big networks and grids uh, we have different things which allow people to change their lives now of course uh, the rich nations do have to catalyze those changes but as we found very early on from the Kyoto Protocol, uh, when people thought, well, it's a good idea. If we can invest a dollar in New York, it only gets us so much greenhouse gas emissions. If we invest that same dollar in parts of the developing world, it's called the developing or emerging world, 
we get 10 times the amount of greenhouse gas emission. And that's still the case in many parts of the world. So we need to level the playing field a bit by making sure that the commitments that the uh, developed world are making to the developing world, $100 billion that's uh, earmarked, actually happens. I think I calculated that $100 billion in 2009 is about $140 billion today. So we're a little bit behind the curve, even if we make up the commitment. Uh, look, I think it's, uh, in the grand scale of things, it's a very small amount of money compared with what we need to spend. Yeah. But again, the signal of starting there, and let's see how it goes from there, it's a start. You know, I would rather have something which begins a process and makes a commitment albeit falling short of what it really should be, than having nothing because we can't make a bigger commitment. Yeah. Um, you've always been a great champion of diversity and inclusiveness, and we've just heard that you started your climate journey over 25 years ago. So what are the three things you would like to... Um, what's your wisdom for three things future energy leaders should really be putting into practice or bearing in mind? So they all, all of them, which I'm sure they do, is remember that energy is a system. Uh, it's not just one type of energy playing against another type. It's the integration of all parts of the energy chain, including nuclear, of course, which we haven't mentioned it. Nuclear is really important, and I believe will have an increasing role, frankly, in the world. Uh, but it's a system. So first thing is, remember it's a system. Don't say... It can all be done by wind or it can all be done by solar. It can't. It's a it's system. So remember that. Secondly, remember it's about what? It's about the consumer. It's about how people use it. So please remember that efficiency and conservation are important things. They are important things. And while you may be a supplier of energy, you're much better off if people use it efficiently. You are really. And, and thirdly, uh, remember that it, this is a, a great industry that takes great people and they need to be encouraged that they're building the future. They're not presiding over a legacy, they're building the future. And whatever they're doing, they are building that. And that will allow great people to keep coming into the industry. One last one from me, if I might. And that is, you've, you've written, you, you're a great um, proponent of engineering, but you've also talked in your recent book about imagination. So who are the people that really make the future of energy? Uh, well, those who make it, uh, I, I believe, will think about it and it will create even more imaginative solutions. I entitled a book, Make, Think, Imagine, and everybody took out a red pen and said, it's the other way around. Imagine, think and make. I feel that human beings have an inherent belief in making things from flint axes through to experimental rigs, which used to become, became computers, to tinkering with cars, gardens, uh, in the kitchen, everything. And people want to make things and by making things, they think about how they're made and then they imagine how better they could be made or what different things could happen. And I think that's uh, the way probably a large amount of practical life works. There are a few people who can imagine things and of course create the future that way, but they still observe what's going on around them. And I think that's part of the making to think, to imagine. Um, so I believe that's the way that we should do it in energy. We, Observe the world around us and see what's going on and, and what we have to replace. You know, when you, when you think about greenhouse gas reductions, it's always good to think about strategies. Tell me all the things that people need. Tell me about how much greenhouse gases they make and then figure out how to reduce it down to zero while still providing what people need. That's the important way of thinking. Uh, and that's rather practical. Lord Brown, John, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your time with us today. It's been lovely speaking to you as part of We Talks. It's a pleasure.